Welcome to the Vice Chancellor's Roundtable uh, here at NYU Abu Dhabi. Um, we are in our very large auditorium because every classroom on this campus is filled with students doing things and learning and other activities. And we think that's great. People will be trickling in through the afternoon as classes end. And we're really just thrilled to see all of you. Uh, you're also, we're also being filmed so that we can share the roundtable as we always do with our whole student and alumni community who are so interested in hearing from the leaders who grace this stage and who are so kind to accept my invitation to talk with me. Um, in this kind of setting, with many students present uh, or funneling questions to us, uh, the, the idea of the roundtable, some of you who haven't been to one before, have, has anyone been to a roundtable before? Not yet. It's always a changing landscape, which is very good. We started them two years ago when I felt uh, when the pandemic had already been underway a while. <clears throat> I had intended to start doing this in 2019 when it wasn't really possible in that spring. And the idea is that we bring to the round table every three weeks or so a leader of an industry, a leader of an organization who's been on an interesting personal journey uh, to that position of influence and effectiveness in the world. MW Abu Dhabi is an extremely aspirational institution. We try to prepare our students for all sorts of leadership, hopeful leadership, energetic leadership in fields of endeavor that interest them. And these fields can be anything. And therefore, the, the, the people who come to my roundtable can be from any industry. And so we've had leaders of media companies, leaders of the arts. We had the two great museum directors from town. We've had uh, people in banking, people in investment banking, venture capital, value creation. We've had several diplomats, leading ambassadors of the United States and other countries, and so on and so forth. And we will just keep on going. And this year, we have, uh, we'll look forward to having a tech entrepreneur or two, the leader of a major manufacturing organization, someone from energy. Uh, we will keep going. And uh, please spread the word to your peers uh, that we, uh, uh, Donna Downey, who organizes this with me, the head of the Career Development Center, she and I are open to any suggestions. And we will find good people, because people like to talk to you all. You are amazing students from so many countries, especially from the United Arab Emirates, but also the 120 other countries that you come from. And so leaders like to come here, and especially leaders like Ahmed Sevak, about whom I'll say something in just a second, because they are interested in the talent, in the questions that you can bring forward, and they're interested often in hiring you later or having you in our internship program and so forth. So with that, I am especially thrilled to introduce my friend and colleague Ahmed Sivak, because he is a leader in global education, international education, as it used to be called, and has been for a very long time. And he is, I would say, constitutionally committed to it, the way this institution is and the way that I, I, I am. He has been a driving force in education, in learning, and in workforce development, and how these things connect around the globe for two decades. And now, since the spring, he has become the president and the CEO of ETS. ETS stands for the Educational Testing Service. And ETS is basically the largest private educational assessment organization in the world. Ahmed has working with him some 20,000 employees across 200 countries and serving anywhere in any given year from some 25 to 50 million people a year with tests. And you may say, since you may probably have taken some of these tests, anybody here taken TOEFL before or something like that, or the SAT? OK, you know from tests. You know about tests are hard. And you may say, how's that helping me? But we're going to talk about that. Because actually, the work that ETS does, which I know well because I serve on the board of ETS, really is intended to help uh, people realize their educational ambitions, regardless of where, what their backgrounds are. Before he came to ETS, he had led the University of Europe, a special institution in Madrid, in Spain. 
and also the International University in Malaysia, known as INTI, as well as the Universidad Tecnológica de México, UNITEC, in Mexico. So you get a sense of his globalism. I think I'm a global leader in education. I don't know. Um, he is also a coach and an advisor for edtech companies, especially for CEOs, and he serves on numerous boards, including Cambria Education, City Bridge, and Education Design Lab. He holds a bachelor and a master's from the University of Chicago and an MBA from Harvard Business School. Please join me in welcoming Ahmed Seba. Thank you. Thank you. So Ahmed, when our students see an influential leader like yourself, it's often so hard to imagine how did this person get there? How did you get started? And what happened along the way? Can you please tell us how you began your career journey? Well, th thanks very much for the kind welcome and uh, the background. It's, it's just great to be here uh, with you and your element uh, here at uh, NYU Abu Dhabi. And thank you all for coming today and, and, and for having me here today. I, um, you know, my, my journey really starts with my parents. I um, was very fortunate to have parents who really cared a lot about education. Uh, my parents grew up uh, in Gujarat, uh, in the western part of India. And uh, my grandparents really had a dream for my dad to go get some education internationally. So he went from India mm -hmm. to the States, and uh, he took the TOEFL, which is an ETS test, to get into an American university. And um, you know, the journey really started with uh, him and my mom eventually raising us in the United States. But with that orientation that education matters, that thinking of oneself as part of an international community matters. So I think some of those seeds started, Marriott, really early in life. I grew up in Chicago, and um, you know, it was a community that was very American. Uh, as an American suburb of Chicago. But yet, we grew up in an Indian community. So I already had that connectivity to India, that connectivity to the States. Um, it was really in college that, um, it was really my freshman year of college specifically, uh, when I came across a professor who just inspired me. I thought I was going to go be an econ major, go do something in business, be a consultant or a banker. You mentioned investment banking earlier. I thought that was you know, the trajectory, very practical kind of immigrant mindset of go to college to go get a job and do something financially worthwhile, if that, if that makes sense. But this professor, he was a professor of sociology, and he got me really thinking about impact and equity and issues of um, how do you help people that are coming from less advantaged uh, areas. And I just got really inspired by this professor, and I asked him if I could be a research assistant for him. And that really started me on a very different trajectory. So it was really actually in college uh, when I started to think of myself not just as somebody who might one day want to do something administrative or in a business context, but really to have some sort of a social impact, something that I felt really good about. Um, so that started me on the journey. And over the last you know, 25 years, I've worked in educational organizations in different uh, contexts. Uh, but, but the origin story, if you will, started from my parents and, and from college. This is wonderful. And uh, any, any first years in the room? Very good. I had meant to say this in our academic convocation the other day, and I forgot. The one piece of advice that people, the students often ask me, what is, what is the one piece of advice, Mariette or Vice Chancellor, that you want to give us when they first come to college? And I say the same thing that I said to my children. It's very simple. In the very first semester, make sure that one professor gets to know you. It can be more of them. Meet a professor. It doesn't matter whether it's in the classroom or in the offices. Go to those office hours. They're there for you. And just begin to talk about what motivates you and interests you. It doesn't have to be in your major. It can be. It can just be someone who uh, you find interesting. And make sure they get to know you, because it will, it will help you navigate your journey. At the minimum, you'll have someone who can recommend you later and who will know who you are. So thank you for that pitch. You know, we're good friends, but we didn't plan this in advance. <laughs> so thank you very much. And so I would also say, um, 
your journey obviously has been very mobile, and that parallels, I think, the journey of our students from all these countries, whether they're from the Emirates or not. What have you learned from studying and working in so many different global contexts? You, you don't have to go through your whole journey. It's a complex, but just, just a sense yeah. of what it means to you to be in a global education space. There's, there's so many things, but one that just comes to mind is just our, our common humanity. The sense that you could be here in Abu Dhabi, you could be in New York, you could be in Shanghai, you could be in you know, Malaysia and Mexico. There's, we're, we're all kind of figuring things out at different stages of life. Um, you become more empathetic, I think, to suffering. You see different kinds of suffering, right? Some of that can be economic, some of that could be mental health, some of that could be just situations that people are in. So I think, you be, at least for me, I became much more empathetic uh, when I started working outside of the, my home country of the United States. I think the other big thing I learned is there are great people everywhere. And, you know, there's, it's just, it's just this awakening that uh, when you're living in another country and you're studying in another country that you just meet people, uh, you know, curious and talented and smart and, you know, just adventuresome. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, that, that, that's very exciting. And I think I, I also learned to listen more, I think, to talk less um, because I, you know, come to another country and I just realize I'm in a new context. I don't really, I'm not, uh, even if I'm in a leadership role, I don't necessarily know exactly what's going on in this context. So asking more questions, taking a little bit more time. Um, yeah, and, and I think the other thing I, I learned is there's, there's so much joy that, uh, you know, comes from immersing yourself in another culture, in another context. There's just something about losing yourself and not being stuck in your mental habits and your patterns and just saying, I'm going to make friends in this new context. I'm going to understand this. I'm going to try to speak a bit of this language and just have fun with it. And there is a, an element, you know, we watch Netflix these days. We uh, go uh, do different activities to get, you know, away to watch the movies. You know, just travel and, and being outside gives you that sense of just sort of a very different experience that I think is so healthy. I think it just taps into different parts of your brain. It makes you a, a more well-rounded person. So yeah, those are just a couple of things. But I think the most important thing is it just, I think, makes you more human. You know, I had a um, friend who recently met an astronaut uh, for the first time. And he asked the astronaut, you're, um, you're out in outer space. And you're, what was one thing you took away from it? And the astronaut said he looked down at planet Earth and he just realized how from planet Earth, you're looking down at humanity, we just all are so similar, right? There's just a certain commonness around it all. When we're on the planet, we're just thinking of our differences and dividing among countries or you know, different backgrounds and so forth. But when you're looking at and just imagining people, it's just a, you know, this sense of universality, I think, that just really kind of kind of connected for me. So would you say then that connecting this to your global education commitments, which are so profound and long lasting, do you see it as a bulwark against these kinds of divisions? Absolutely. Uh, the, the world is in a difficult spot right now. I think education is, can be and has been and will be uh, one of the biggest bridges. Uh, you know, we're living, as you know, Mary, in a world right now where there's a lot of tension, um, geopolitical, economic, um, the role of technology and all of this, and um, the haves and the have-nots and the separations that we're seeing. And uh, I think, I think it, education has such an enormous role to play in bringing people together, helping people understand what role they can play, um, galvanizing, getting people excited, you know, to, to, to do something more, do something bigger. You know, we all live in our bubble, right? But to be able to be in an education context like this and to really just be in education and to see oneself as constantly learning is an opportunity to really build, build bridges. Uh, we need more. We need a lot more bridges, not just in this region, but you know, between China and the US, between the East and the West, right, as we imagine a potential other Cold War coming. So I, I, I still believe 
and it might be a little idealistic and optimistic, but I still believe in this notion of, you know, uh, soft, um, more soft power, more, more, more diplomatic connectivity uh, that, that can bring people together. Because I, I actually think it's, it's the only thing that ever will. Um, when you think about when you think about the world and humanity and history. Before I'm going to ask you the tough questions about how testing relates and assessments relate to that vision. Uh, a few more things to humanize you even further than we already have done because you're <laughs> obviously an extremely engaging person. So there's a long journey from that first professor in college to all these things you went on to do. We talk a lot about mentorship here and we try to provide it to students, employees, ourselves for that matter. Mentors come in many shapes uh, of many kinds, formal and informal. Is there can you identify a mentor and say something about that mentor who really helped you on your professional journey past college? There was a, I was working at a consulting company uh, soon after college, and there was a partner at the firm who was significantly more senior. I was in my 20s, he was in his you know, 20 years, 30 years older. And um, when you're in your 20s, everyone just seems older, right? So he was older. And he looked at, um, and, and he just, you know, kind of, kind of took me under his wing a little bit. And, you know, I, I, uh, I, was, I was what was called a non-traditional consultant. I had, uh, when I first graduated from, from college, I thought I was going to be a professor. I started doing teaching and research. I even applied for PhD programs thinking I was going down the academic track. And about two or three years into that, I, I shifted and I went down more of the consulting and then eventually more of the administrative route. And so he, um, you know, he, he, he recognized that I was not quite figuring it out yet. I remember one day I had a project where I had to put together a spreadsheet and uh, I just, I couldn't quite figure out all these formulas. I hadn't learned this stuff. I was a sociology and econ major. I hadn't quite learned all of this financial. And, and he just said, hey, just, you know, ask for help. And I thought, oh, yeah, I don't have to have it all figured out. I had my sort of professorial hat on that I, I was the teacher, I needed to have the answers. And at that moment, it was just a simple moment of just, hey, go ask for help. And that just stayed with me. Um, and, uh, and of course, I took him up on his <laughs> offer and probably asked for more help than he cared to, you know, always respond to, but he was always patient with me. And I think that that, that, that interaction made me realize the power of just asking for help. Just ask for help. And it just takes a lot of pressure off when you realize you can, can reach out. So he was, he was particularly powerful. Another one that really helped me, if I can give one more yeah, that please. was They're especially powerful. Yeah. I, was, I, was, um, I was at, a, uh, at an event like this, and I was at business school, and a, um, and a CEO came in and he um, talked about the importance of sales. He talked about the importance of knowing how to persuade, how to convince, and a light bulb just went off. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I never thought about that. And he mm -hmm. said, it doesn't mo matter what you want to do in life. If you want to go work in a nonprofit, work in government, work in universities, work in a company, it doesn't matter what you want to do in life. Know how to convince someone of something. And the light bulb went off and he said, you know, every, most people who graduate from many business schools will go do different, you know, uh, entry level roles. But if you can, take, a, take an alternative path and just do one, one year of selling. And I thought this is such an alternative idea, but it kind of grabbed me. And so I ended up approaching him and getting some advice from him. And I thought, let me go try that. So I actually, of the 800 people that graduated from business school that year, I was one of the only ones, I think one of two, uh, that actually did a sales job for a year before I actually then went and did more administrative roles. And I think that, that actually had a big impact on me. It made me understand how to listen intently. It made me understand how to be more of a problem solver. It made me understand the importance of breaking big problems down to small problems. And, um, and so anyway, th that was a very important moment for me. And I kind of, I've always kept that in the back of my head. I think. What you sell? What do I sell? What did you sell? <laughs> uh, at that time? Yeah. I sold, 
I sold, uh, it was an LMS, a learning management system. Uh -huh. uh, and it was for corporations. So I would um, go into the vice president of human resources at The Gap, uh, at uh, Hewlett Packard, at Disney, um, where else? Oh, at Nike. And we would convince them back then that they needed our platform in order to train their employees. So they would buy our software. It was a corporate, it was essentially a portal. And then we would put third party content on there. And then they could go train tens of thousands of employees. And so, and I had a great mentor, John, who helped me figure out how to do that whole thing. Um, but yeah, it was my first time actually uh, seeing the intersection of education and technology come together. This was, you know, b before the concept of ed tech existed, it was 20 plus years ago. But yeah, I was selling learning software to companies. This is a really great piece of advice, I think. And I'm just, just as a throwback, I never think about this episode anymore because I didn't particularly like it, but I think I learned a lot. My second job out of college, you know, right after college, you'll have lots of different jobs, inshallah. And my second job after about a year of being an editor and a writer, I joined a publishing company in science textbooks and I, as an editor, I wanted to be a developmental editor. And they said, yeah, that's good. But first, you have to go into the field and sell these college textbooks. And my territory, as they called it, was Northern California. And it was so hard. But I really did learn, learn a lot from it. It's very interesting you mentioned that's that. That's interesting. I did not know that yeah. about you. And yeah. actually, my territory was also Northern California. Well, that's we why, could have met in a previous life. That's why I had, yeah, all of those companies. <laughs> that, is, that is really great. Let's. Let's look at what you're working on now, because I've been very eager to have had a, have an educational leader here, because you work not only in the graduate and undergraduate space, the college and university space, but also K through 12. So let's get down to what it is that ETS sells. So ETS has a vision, a very powerful vision, to advance equity and equality in education by means of assessments. And it also develops and administers some of the most famous tests in the world. The TOEFL, the SAT, the GRE, other tests you've heard about. Could you describe how ETS pursues this mission of equity and opportunity in education? So ETS started 75 years ago, right after World War II in 1947. And at that time, the founding team members of ETS were really striving to increase the pool of candidates to go to colleges and universities. So if you think back after World War II, not just in the United States, but throughout the world, there were very, very small percentage of people would go to college, right? Would have the opportunity like we all have had and are having to be in a university context. It was very small, it was less than 10% of, of the United States and certainly the world. And so they had this vision that if we could have a test that could give an opportunity for individuals who weren't physically near that college, but that could take the test in different parts of the United States or the world, we could, in some sense, democratize access to higher education to open up the pool of potential candidates. So that was the initial vision, where testing was seen as a way to enable opportunity for people to go to college. And so then the SAT back then really came from testing that was done in the military, in the United States and in Europe, the IQ tests and other types of standardized tests to help individuals uh, figure out where in the military they could work, right? And so these aptitude tests were really a key reason why many of these large organizations, militaries, were able to really function and get people into the right roles as they were going out and, 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 and fighting battles. So, with that spirit of taking that concept and applying it to higher education, the journey began. And ETS, over the first couple of decades, really was focused on high stakes standardized tests for college admissions. Then um, a few decades went by, and in the 60s, 70s, the organization started to expand into other types of assessments. One of the big demands that came up in the 1960s and 70s where there were more and more people that wanted to come into American colleges from other countries. And so the universities were struggling with, well, how do I test for uh, someone's English proficiency? And so the TOEFL was born. 
um, the test of English as a foreign language. And that then opened up a whole series of other types of tests. For example, teacher licensure. If somebody wanted to be a teacher in a K-12 school, like a primary or secondary school, there was a need that many states in the United States and other countries had to, how do you evaluate a potential teacher? So these different kinds of assessments, uh, assessments in the K-12 context, assessments in higher ed, assessments for languages, uh, started to come about. They were intended to help colleges or other institutions um, or states uh, better evaluate talent. ETS has uh, a long history of helping provide different types of assessments for different needs. And uh, this, this, this is a bit of the spirit. As Marriott, you mentioned, I mean, our mission has always been to advance both quality and equity in education through assessments. So thinking about access, how is it panning out? Of course, the pandemic and even predating the pandemic brought concerns about equity in admissions that you've already referenced. You know, so a very small slice of society used to go to university. But so in recent years, uh, we've seen broad calls for educational institutions like ours to reconsider their standardized testing requirements because they sometimes seem to get in the way. And I'd like to talk a little bit, have you hear you talk a little bit about what you think about this debate about standardized testing. And I'd like you to think about it both as the leader of ETS, which is of course very committed to developing and administering testing, and as the parent of a child who just started college at NYU, Tish, new parent, NYU Tish, yay. <laughs> what are the challenges and the opportunities now for ETS? Really just take some time to unpack for us what and you know, whether equity can truly be rhymed today with standardized testing. Most schools went test optional, as you know. It's a great question and it's a fundamental question for ETS. As Many of you may have heard uh, in the United States and other parts of the world, there's a, there's a real discussion going on about should we have an entrance exam? Should we support standardized testing? Does it even matter? Is it fair? Uh, and these are, these are pretty fundamental questions that really during the pandemic uh, became accelerated. First, I want to start with ETS's view on this and, 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 um, and, 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 and what ETS is, is uh, doing to address some of the questions. I think the first thing to recognize is one of the things ETS is super proud of is the extent to which we really do a lot of validity to ensure unbiasedness in our tests. We really take time when we're developing an item, uh, which is a question, uh, to really make sure that the question has been validated by having folks from different backgrounds, uh, different geographies, uh, gender diversity, to ensure that a response to that test uh, is one that doesn't unfairly impact one community versus another. So our tests are really designed to be fair and valid. We do lots of sampling before we actually have a test go live in an actual high stakes context. So we really stand by our tests, I stand by our tests, because there's so much science and so much work that's done in ensuring that the tests are unbiased, that there's true equity. Uh, and that regardless of someone's background, gender, geography, that we're getting statistically reliable results that really represent that individual's um, you know, uh, abilities uh, at that state, of, uh, uh, at that moment of time. At the same time, the world is changing. And there is a perspective that says we really need to think differently, that I, a meet, am more than my number. I'm more than my number. You're more than your number. You're more than your score on a standardized test. And that, that's a truth that I'd like to invite us all to consider, right? That, that I am more than a result on a particular test. And therefore, a college counselor or a college advisor that's looking at my ability to come in, uh, an admissions officer, would be wanting to look at a portfolio uh, of an individual. and so. We are still very much standing by our tests. We really believe that our tests are truly, truly unbiased, and we're really putting a lot of rigor into it. We've been doing this for decades. We do, as, as you mentioned, uh, tens of millions of assessments every year. And so there's a lot of rigor and a lot of validity where our tests are uh, offered in 
over 200 countries throughout the world. But at the same time, we also recognize that the world wants to move beyond a particular test or, or, a, or a, uh, a couple of numbers to determine whether someone can get in or not get into a college. And so for us, we've been starting to look at all alternative types of assessments. Uh, one of the things we're most proud of is what we like to th call holistic assessments, where you can look at a quantitative score, but you can also develop a series of assessments to evaluate uh, other abilities, other skills. And so a portfolio is submitted into a college admissions office. We have an organization that's part of ETS called Kira that's really encouraging universities uh, to start to build other types of assessments beyond just the high stakes standardized tests. Um, so we, at the, on the one hand, believe and are continuing to drive for equity in our assessments. And on the other hand, we're also looking for ways to go beyond traditional standardized assessments as the primary way uh, that colleges admit folks. That's very interesting and seems to open new possibilities for where assessment could really help people. And I've heard you talk in previous settings and interviews about ETS's new potential role in lifelong learning and assessment in that context, helping people who are beyond K through 12 or beyond university measure progress. And we are really interested here in investing in a, a generation of lifelong learners. We call ourselves a learning community. I'm in education because I love to learn. And I think this is true for many people working in education. If you don't love to learn, you should not go into education because you'll be doing it all the time. Now, what types of lifelong learning do you think uh, where, where it's important or possible to offer better measurement tools that really help people? What are, can you tell us about some of the products you're thinking about? Yeah. Well, one of the ones I'm thinking about that I think um, the NYU community could be very interested in are assessments designed to help you detect your passions. Career navigation, career discovery, um, interest development. These are forms of assessments that are really an opportunity for self-reflection. And I really believe that's where the future is going. I really believe that assessments that are for institutions like a K-12 school or a university or, or a company are, are uh, supporting the institution's mandate. But I really love to think about assessments that really help people get a better handle of what are my skills, like a Fitbit you know, or other type of watch that allows me to track my steps and my heart rate. I'd love to think about how assessments can be more uh, able to help individuals figure out and get a pulse of where they are on, on a suite of skills, get you a photo that this is where I am across this uh, list of skills and what are the gaps versus where I want to go, and then helping me think about that, that pathway. Um, so that's, that's where I see a lot of opportunity, is to truly democratize in the 21st century way and to make more ex uh, accessible some of these kinds of assessments. The other, on the workplace side, that I'm very excited about is there's a whole suite of soft skills, uh, sometimes called power skills. These are basically non-technical skills like STEM or math type skills, right? The skills that are much more around communication and critical thinking and those kinds of skills. Those skills are becoming incredibly important in the work world today. And our ability for adaptability and entrepreneurial thinking and some of these other kinds of mindsets, intercultural fluency, these are, these are actual skills, right? And we, as a, as a society, have an opportunity to start to identify where individuals are at and then an opportunity to invest in upskilling and, and training on those skills. So these so-called soft skills, in some sense, are the hard skills for the 21st century. And especially in a global community like NYU Abu Dhabi, where so many of you will be doing uh, jobs in very international co contexts, um, those kinds of skills are going to be mission critical. So we're launching a series of products and services. The first one is called a prize, which is really designed to uh, offer abilities for individuals and companies to better assess these kinds of soft skills. So I'm very excited about those. I really believe that that's the future, um, both for institutions as well as for individuals. That's a very exciting idea. I think it's hard to do, and that makes it, of course, especially interesting. And thinking about that, one, so it's very interesting to hear you talk about strategy. When you're a business leader, you can never just rest and think that people are still going to want your project product tomorrow. Standard testing will survive, I think, but you can imagine there being a range of you know, resistances to it and certain products will be 
less popular than others. So you have to constantly also think about these 20,000 people in this big research enterprise. ETS is a massive research uh, arm. You want to keep using that. So you know, thinking about that. So if you think about that, <clears throat> here's a different kind of product that I don't think automatically assumes assessment, and yet is something that's much needed in the world of lifelong learning. And this is, I think, something that many of you will have heard about, something like a digital wallet or a digital passport that you carry with you wherever you are so that, and from the minute you go to preschool to when you take your first swimming lessons to when you graduate maybe from school or you maybe move school a couple of times and it's hard to keep track of your records. And you know, you know how many people have very, you know, meandering journeys through their learning um, environments over time. And so a lot of credits get lost. Some of you have probably have to look for diplomas to show to people <laughs> that you had them, right? It's a total pain. There are hard copies and you can't find them back and so the ministry is closed or whatever it is. Do you see an opportunity there for ETS from an assessment point of view or would it take retooling the strategy for the university? That's a great for the question. Organization? I think so. I think so. I think that the world is evolving in which uh, access to those credentials readily available on my phone is going to become extremely critical. For us, we see the world moving towards increasing recognition of skills, right? And so when you're thinking about your journey here at NYU Abu Dhabi, you're going to get a degree. But can you imagine if you could get a series of additional credentials, certificates, uh, that could be based on completing a program, uh, could be based on taking a test of some kind that validates or recognizes a completion of a program on a particular skill. It might be project management or uh, product management, or it could be something different, design thinking or in a new space, uh, photography. And so the world is starting to recognize both the degree and the competency, right? The actual skill that you've been able to develop. And so this notion of having a wallet that allows you to recognize some of those is really powerful. And uh, it's very interesting. I was just in India last week, and I was with the Ministry of Education in India, and they'd invited us to uh, port the completion of students' tests with ETS into exactly what you were describing, uh, mm -hmm. into what they call a, a digidoc, uh, a digital uh, wallet that the Indian government's providing that already has their, you know, an Indian citizen's driver's license and um, a health card and others. And the idea was for them to be able to port even your completion of your TOEFL, um, your GRE, let alone other certificates and, and other programs that we'll be offering. So I think the world is coming. My sense is, is that it's starting country by country right now. I hear France is doing something similar. Singapore has something similar. Many countries, and I know even here in the UAE, uh, during COVID, the, the uh, pass that shows green when you are uh, you know, negative. Don't uh, talk to us about that. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are all but more familiar than But it's the same idea, right? But it's, it's the, the same, same idea, idea, right? Yeah. That it's almost become like your ID now to get in. <laughs> That's exactly it, exactly. Keep it green. <laughs> Keep it green, good job. <laughs> and so that document is now not only your COVID um, status, but it's, it's your ID in some senses. And you can imagine over time the government building more and more uh, credentialing uh, capabilities. So I, I see that happening Mary, more country by country right now. I'd love to imagine that over time it'll be across countries, but that may take a little while in the world we're living right now. I think that's going to evolve, but I, I hope it does. Uh, but the good news is, is that with blockchain and security, we can have in the power of our phone a way to demonstrate these competencies. That's where we're going, and that's exciting for me. It's super exciting. That's great, and it's very interesting how you just positioned what ETS would do in relation to this development, because of course we all would like to see the DigiDoc or the Passport, but ETS's role and bread and butter is assessment and assessing human capabilities. And, and so it's in a way you will be providing the verified content to pour into these containers, these digital containers, whatever those apps are going to look like. It's a very interesting strategy. That's exactly right. So this is also a way of talking a little bit about how you think about business. It is always important not to try to do everything at once. And so I want to ask you, since I use this forum sometimes to ask questions that it took me years to find out because I was too afraid to ask, 
back when I was working for that publishing company, and I was just thinking about making books and working with writers, and I thought it was very exciting. But of course, that company too had a bottom line, and we, that's why they made me go into sales for, for half a year and things like that. So that's where I had to figure out the difference between project management and product management. Everybody know the difference between that? I didn't know that when I was 20, I have to say. What's the difference between product <laughs> management and project management? That's a Are great they question. kind of the same thing? That's a great question. <laughs> you know, it's project management is the ecosystem of activities that go into the beginning and ending of a project, of a particular uh, task uh, that often involves and can involve multiple people. Um, it involves timelines. And it involves something very important called dependencies, where if you're building, for example, this beautiful auditorium, the uh, head of the construction of this has to be thinking, well, gosh, I need to first have the floor in place before I can start putting up the studs to then have the roof eventually on top. There's a dependency, one after the other. And so project management is that whole discipline of managing uh, these kinds of complex tasks uh, that involve individuals, timelines, and dependencies. Product management is really the development of a particular individual product or service that can be for a commercial purpose or for a nonprofit purpose. And that also has some similarities to project management. There's typically beginning and middle. But the product management discipline, what's, what's fascinating is in the world of technology over the last two decades, has really become a, a new discipline because it intersects the marketing side, the technology side, and the people side. And so product management is all of the activities that go into the uh, imagination of a new product or service to fit a customer need, the development of capabilities around that, the design, the development, and the deployment of a product. And so the world used to be very focused on project management. And I think especially with the acceleration of technology and the rapid pace with which new products and services can be launched, that this, this new discipline of product management has become really center stage. There's a wonderful company in San Francisco called Product School, productschool.com, that provides certificates uh, for individuals to learn product management. I, I, I would highly recommend checking that out. I think uh, if I were in college today, I, I think product management is a discipline in its own right. Um, that uh, really, I think, in the next 20 years, you're going to see more and more applicability for across industries and nonprofit, government, corporate world. I think this is very helpful because even in education, which is, of course, what we're talking about today, after all, I always say universities have two great products, and they are educated people who go into the world and do really amazing things, you hope and you hope that you've trained them well, and the other is research, knowledge production. And all of those, the journeys of a research outcome is a product and, and a product management. This is both a product and a product management That's right. um, uh, enterprise. And the same can be true for education. So it's a very useful rubric, I think. Um, in, and it doesn't matter whether it's for a commercial venture or that's something exactly else right. that you care about. One thing that's sort of, as you asked the question, I started thinking is that project management typically has to, is, is, is trying to solve a problem by a particular point in time, mm. typically. Whereas product management is usually trying to solve a particular customer's problem. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's an audience that you're trying to solve for. And so that distinction of, I'm trying to get something done to complete a task on time versus I'm trying to solve a, a problem to fit a social or business uh, or constituency need. I think this is so helpful because many of our students, and I myself have seen myself in this role always, uh, I like to think that I'm doing something not particularly for a direct commercial return, but for making a, a difference in the world and, and achieving some kind of purpose. And I think that's very interesting to think about because many of our students don't particularly want to work for financial companies. Some do, others don't, but there are many, many different ways in which one can make a difference. And so in this broader sense, thinking about ETS, 20,000 employees, 200 countries, millions and millions served, as a certain hamburger company used to say, <laughs> um, does it matter 
whether an educational services company like yours is for profit or not, is there a difference? Can you talk about that? That's a great question. So, and this is a question I wish I had someone explain this to me when I was in college, to be honest. So I'm going to take a stab at it, and hopefully this will help. At, at one level, to be a nonprofit versus a for-profit is a legal status, right? It's what a country's um, incorporation, entity, philosophy states. A for-profit is this type of company. They're allowed to make a profit, and then they get taxed a certain way. And then a nonprofit is given a different legal status. It's a different type of organization that the, that the country says, ah, this type of organization has a different mission, and therefore, we're not going to charge profit. Uh, we're not going to charge taxes against their surplus. And so there is, at one level, a legal distinction for many countries. There's also a philosophical one. And I would say, probably 30 years ago, 40 years ago, when you looked at for-profits and non-profits, a for-profit was making money, was generating revenue through the sale of products and services. That revenue, you were subtracting cost, and then revenue minus cost got your profit. And that, that was the aim of the company, was to generate financial returns. The company had an, some investors or it had an owner, and that owner or owners basically had rights to that. On the nonprofit side, it was a mission that had created the organization. And that mission may have created a board of trustees that were the fiduciaries responsible for ensuring that that mission continued. And so that's the philosophical distinction. There's a legal distinction for tax purpose, and then there's almost a philosophical one. This one's for profit, for returning um, economic value to the shareholders versus a nonprofit that's for the mission. What's happened that's fascinating, Marriott, for me is in the last two decades, and I would say really in the last five to seven years globally, there has been a merging of those concepts. And you're seeing more and more for-profit organizations talking about mission. You talk about Google. You talk about even Starbucks. They, they, they have these aspirational mission statements. They're about the public good. They're about knowledge. Um, you've got all of this kind of you know, ESG, the environmental movement, and, and other stakeholder movement that's encouraging companies to be about helping others. And so there's been this sense of companies now having more of a social impact layer to them, and leaders wanting to talk about that and not talk as much about the profit. And then on the flip side, you've got nonprofit organizations that are recognizing, wow, in order for me to sustain my mission, I need to have financial value, and I need to make sure I'm having uh, a budget that I'm hitting. And if I'm having losses for long periods of time, that's a risk to the organization. And so for me, I um, see the distinction between the legal side and the philosophical side is starting to merge. At ETS, we are a nonprofit organization, uh, but we're run in many ways like uh, a, a company. We have revenue, we have costs, and we're really targeting both to deliver on the mission, but also to maintain the sustainability. I like to think about it as, you know, uh, we at ETS have the heart of a nonprofit because we are very mission driven. We really want to serve and make a difference. But we've got the, the mind of a for profit, meaning we're trying to think about products and services, solve problems, use product management uh, to really make sure that we can sustain that mission. So that notion of a balance between the two is what I've come to see more and more organizations on both sides of the aisle are starting to need to embrace the mission, but also the financial sustainability. Very thoughtful indeed. And I think I have seen those convergences. And even thinking about them has helped me a lot in my not-for-profit activities over the years. Um, and that gets to this other thing I wanted to ask you about. Obviously. There's a lot of talk about the first, second, and third industrial revolution and the fourth driven by AI that we are now entering. And the second industrial revolution essentially was driven by energy and especially oil, which is, of course, extremely important in this country and region and has brought us both wonderful things that humans could never have dreamt of uh, and at the same time created, obviously, massive 
climate crisis we have to deal with. And now, interestingly, just as that's happening, where we used to think of oil as the currency that drove these, basically, the second and third industrial revolution, just now I hear it said all the time that data is the new oil. Data and big data. And you've often mentioned that educational assessment is where education meets data. And I'm wonder if you can say more about what you mean by that and where you see data being used really well at scale in education in the education sector. Yeah, no, thanks. I, I, I really do believe that. I really do believe that tests create data and that data has currency. And you see that in sector after sector. How is it that Google is worth a trillion dollars? Right or Facebook, uh, you know all of these billions and many many other companies, they're really organizations that are harnessing the power of data collection. And so for me at ETS, as I looked throughout the education sector, I thought, where is an organization that is really in a responsible way, bringing tests to gather data to allow people to move ahead? And so for me, I see a huge opportunity for. ETS to be the number one education data services organization, really through tests, gathering data, and having that data be available for the individual and the organization to help that individual progress in life. So to me, I really see data as the new oil, and I see testing as the enablement of that data uh, to be available in the education sector. The important part is to do this responsibly, because as all of us know, data can be used for both good or not so good. And it's important that organizations that are particularly in areas like education or healthcare are responsible stewards of that data. And that's what we aspire to be as a nonprofit, as a mission-driven organization. We want to have tests be available that help students know where they stand, help institutions to identify students, and help bring forward new forms of education based on that data. So I'm excited about that. But I believe that the long-term trend of education will be to have data drive learning. Right now, if you think about it, so much of how we come into the education world is based on institutions around us. What's my interest? What's my major? But imagine if you can take a test, and you, that test gives you some sense of, hmm, I've got this scale, or I've got this set of interests. And then it recommends, sort of like Amazon might recommend something, or Netflix or another program might recommend a show or recommend a book. Imagine you take a quick test or interact in a way uh, based on a certain skill or interest, and that then prompts you to go pursue a learning opportunity. And so the data can help drive new forms of learning, that new curiosity that for me is super, super exciting. And so the one thing I don't see anywhere in the world today, sitting in 2022, is there isn't an organization out there, I think, as, as positioned as well as ETS is to become the leading education data services company. And that's why I joined ETS a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. It's a very exciting uh, uh, vision indeed. And let's see a quick show of hands. Who of the students here is thinking about or already studying something like social research and public policy or economics or some sort of social science, several of you. Go social science. Go social science. And of course, what does social science need to do its work? Data. And here, ETS is sitting on a carefully locked gold mine of data. <laughs> think about those 25 to 50 million tests. I mean, I took the TOEFL a bunch of times, I think, to get better at it. Um, SAT, GRE, I, I, I've been a good consumer of this <laughs> Thank this you, product. we appreciate it. Yeah, it's probably sitting somewhere <laughs> in some old, old, old data cards. Um, how, how does ETS contribute its data gathering, which of course it's private and so forth, but how, is there a way that ETS can contribute its data to broader educational research enterprise that's not directly connected to how we develop our products at ETS? Is there some, can you contribute to the greater good of education research? And, and how would we do that? Or how do you do it? A couple ways. One is uh, we are the administrators of the PISA test. Mm -hmm. And the PISA, as many of you may have heard of, is the OECD's sponsored test that compares where 15-year-olds are uh, performing on math and English and other subjects across about 75 different countries. 
So it's the test that you often hear reference when a leader of a country is saying, hey, we're falling behind on our PISA scores or we're, we're getting ahead on our PISA scores. It's um, a test that we administer. I'm really proud of that mm -hmm. because I think that that is an example of where we're sampling students and cohorts by country and using that data to help countries better understand where they are in relation to other countries. Um, another way that we're doing this is through the NAEP, which mm -hmm. is the United States Department of Education's uh, testing. Uh, we recently um, announced the results of the long-term trend assessment that uh, uh, tracks how nine-year-olds are performing on areas like math and English. And so that's an example of where we showed for, uh, for the United States that uh, there has been a significant um, decay in learning post-COVID. Uh, that students are typically one or two years behind, and that it varies quite a bit based on socioeconomic class. So we try to have these data so sets be helpful to uh, encourage policymakers to redeploy resources and attention uh, to where uh, um, so support is needed the most. Um, so we're, we're very, very committed to finding ways to do high impact policy advising, and some of the work, and part of the reason I'm here in the region uh, as well as in, in South Asia is exactly that. We wanna find ways to partner with governments to really solve complex problems that the governments have around using data responsibly to guide public policy. And that I would say is precisely one of these things that a for-profit company would maybe hope they could do, but wouldn't be their first interest, with, whereas the mission of a not-for-profit company ultimately is to improve and improve policy, improve outcomes, regardless of whether it makes a big pile of money or not. So with that, uh, let's see if there are some questions from That'd the group. That'd be great. Um, and there is a mic that will come to you if you'd like to ask a question. And there are some here in the front already and some in the back. Maybe we'll start in the front here with, um, yeah. We'll go back and forth. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and please so, say, tell us your name and where you are in your journey at MWL. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm Sonia. I'm from Moscow, Russia. I'm freshman. Uh, I will definitely be majoring in economics and definitely minoring in Arabic, possibly with minor in legal studies. Uh, and my question is quite economic, actually, because you started unpacking the idea and the mission of the ETS as a nonprofit. But as someone from a developing country, I wanted to ask, like, how exactly or more mechanically uh, can an educational nonprofit, which is committed to enduring uh, diversity and support for everyone, uh, can think of its like price and uh, how can it develop its price and strategy? Because, for example, in Russia, uh, TOEFL costs uh, more than half of a uh, monthly income of an average Russian, and SIT costs about 20% of one. So uh, I could not afford TOEFL, for example, this winter. Uh, I, could only, uh, I could not afford to take SIT at some moment. And how can uh, an educational company, which is driven to ensure support to those from less privileged backgrounds and one which is also based most likely in a, develop, in, in a developed country where it has to pay its employees more. How can a company balance all of that in these times? And what are the strategies that we can implement? That's a great question, Sonia. Thank you for the question. And it's a, it's a tricky question, so uh, I, uh, I appreciate it. The, the, from a business standpoint, and then I'll talk about the nonprofit side. From a business standpoint, as you know from economics, um, there's, there, there's a price elasticity. And so there's a, there's a point in which you raise prices, as you raise prices, volume drops. And so finding that right balance where you can have your price be enough to cover your costs, because we do have costs when we build tests and distribute tests and score tests, so we want to cover our costs, but at the same time to um, still generate enough volume. So the revenue of any product, right, or any company is price times volume of whatever the product is, right? It could be a, this uh, bottle of water. It's the price of the bottle times the volume is the revenue for that company for the sale of those bottles of water. So for us, we're constantly looking at pricing to be able to optimize a, 
a, a reasonable amount of access to the tests. So that's the business side for us to maintain and to cover our costs. Now, on the mission side, in the world that we're living in, as you rightly said, people are coming from different household incomes and different currencies as well, right? Right now, what we're seeing with the appreciation of the dollar recently is actually making it less affordable uh, to take a TOEFL. Uh, so a TOEFL in the United States for, say, $200 has suddenly become more expensive, say, in, even in Europe, right, with the way the currency has now become almost a dollar to a euro, let alone in Russia and in other emerging markets. And so it is a, it is a tricky question because currencies are constantly changing, GDP is constantly changing. Um, one way we, we've been, Sonia, addressing this is by not increasing the price. So um, a lot of times in education, uh, K-12, higher ed, even workforce certificates, price often increases by inflation plus one or two. So if the inflation rate is 5% for a, uh, a particular educational product, the organization will have that price increase by inflation plus one or two percent in order to cover the inflation costs plus increments for employees or other costs that have to go in. So managing pricing in a global organization is a tricky thing because of this constant fluctuation that's happening in currencies, in GDP, um, also having a sense of equity. Um, one way we are addressing that is through effectively discounts in some countries. Uh, so uh, for example, we um, have in countries in Africa and Asia a price, the list price is the same, but the net price through the discounting that we do in those particular countries allows for more people to afford the test. Um, it's also a phenomenal strategy question. When do you actually reduce the list price versus when do you keep the list price? And one of the things I found for premium brands, like TOEFL is considered a premium product in the English assessment, is that on average you keep the price the same, but then you find ways to reduce the price through discounting or other mechanisms locally. So I would say that there's two parts to the answer. One part is there's a business question, if I could use that term, or a financial question, which is we want to make sure our price covers our cost. And then the second is to try to do it in a way that is, that is um, responsible across markets. I want to make one more point, because I think this question is excellent. Our costs are um, based on a current model of how we deliver. But as we move forward in a global context, and we want to offer products and services, future products and services, we have to think about uh, what kind of labor costs are there and what kind of other distribution costs are there so that we can find much more efficient ways, cost-effective ways to deliver products and services. So as we move forward and look for more efficiency, we'll be able to have the price come down over time. But it's a great question, and uh, it, it, you could see by my long answer that I've been thinking a lot about this very question in the last couple of months because it's actually fundamental not just for ETS's TOEFL product, but for really any future assessment. We want to be moving at the rate of the market and to be affordable to maintain the mission, but also the financials. Good question. Thank you. We had also, OK. Well, you, can, you had a question, too? Yeah. OK, now we'll go to you. Yeah. OK, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you yeah. so much. My name is Ambeta. I'm a freshman from Albania, also planning to major in economics. First of all, thank you for sharing your knowledge and your unique journey. Um, so my question was, yeah, no, actually, uh, I heard from your speech that you are invested in equity and it's a part of your mission, which is very impressive. But I was wondering, um, sorry, this is exciting, <laughs> if there are any policies that assist or accommodate people that are with disabilities. And I was wondering specifically about your new project that is about assessing people's careers, uh, depending on their passions. Do you think of any... Um, possible ways to help those people with disabilities? Mm. Thank you for the question. It's Thank a you. very That's important a question. question. Very, very good question. One of the things I'm very proud of is that we, uh, every time we launch a new assessment, we try to think about what, um, what types of learning differences or disabilities we can address through technology. So for example, uh, if someone's taking one of our assessments and they um, have a learning difference, uh, we try to accommodate. Perhaps instead of it being a three-hour test, we make it a three-and-a-half-hour test. Um, or if uh, an individual is not able to see, we find ways through Braille to make it possible. 
Uh, even our website, uh, we strive at the time of registration to have individuals with differences uh, to be able to have access. Uh, so we provide different options there. Uh, so we, we, we strive to do it. Um, it is continually an ongoing thing. One area I wanted to share, which is um, in the last decade, there's been a growing awareness of, of, of significant differences in how we all learn, right? And so one of the questions now that, that's at the heart of this is really what are the ways that we can assess individuals at different learning stages? And the, the long-term trend is going to be towards increasing personalization of learning. So instead of having a standardized test and you get a number on that test and everyone takes the same test, that was the traditional notion of fairness. If you go back even a couple of decades, right? Everyone gets the same. That's fair. Now, in the world that we live in where we're more aware of differences, learning differences, disabilities, and just differences in general, it's becoming more and more clear that fairness might be more of a personalized question. So that's a big shift in thinking, right? And we're evolving there. But the, but the, but the heart of the question is really what's fair? What is fair? And being able to measure me based on who I am. Is it in comparison to someone else on the standardized test? Or is it compared to who I am based on what, what I bring to the table today? So this moving standardization towards more personalization is part of the answer. But um, you know, we are right now, step by step, trying to put technology to work in different ways to make it possible. But long term, you can imagine assessments that are really going to take a photo of where you are today and then provide you some data points, perhaps based on differences that are similar for others. And so you can say, ah, based on my learning differences, someone else that has these learning differences is scoring around this range. That's where I think things are going to go, but more on that to come. Great question. I'm actually very proud to get questions from econ majors as a, as a former econ guy as well. I also see you on the right side of the room. And if you have a question, just you can also ask. Go ahead. Uh, hi, my name is Farzan. I graduated from NYU in 2018 um, with a degree in engineering. And I've been working here for about three years now. Um, where do you think mental health accommodations factor in when it comes to standardized testing? Testing can often be a very anxiety-inducing thing, especially when you factor in how much money you kind of pay for it. And that money can look very different from people coming from different socioeconomic backgrounds. So it can all, almost be like a two-month, two three-month preparation period building up to that one, three-hour or four-hour period. Um, and sometimes, you know, students who might have anxiety, who might be suffering from different kind of men mental health conditions, how do we factor that in uh, as to not be representative of their actual ability? Yeah. Oh, that's an awesome question. Great questions. That, uh, so a couple of thoughts. Number one is we've, we've re recently become much more aware of mental health and in our um, context, social emotional learning right and thinking a lot about what impact does my mental state have on my outcomes and there's been a lot of fascinating research including some members of our board that have been engaged in some of this activity of trying to really assess what the particular psychology that someone has in, in impacts the test and the data starting to show that different mental states produce different outcomes right if you've got incredible anxiety and you're not able to handle that anxiety for a variety of reasons that leads to one outcome on a test versus you're in a different stage and for a variety of reasons you may have anxiety but you're managing it differently. You may have learned coping mechanisms that allow you to manage it and therefore you have an outcome that's different on that test. So those are things that we're just starting to come to the surface on and it is raising the same question around moving from standardized testing to more personalized tests. Um, it is also very cultural. You know, I, I, as I mentioned, I just came from India. And you know, it is a country that is incredibly focused on high stakes tests. You've got the engineering tests, you've got the test for medicine, you've got tests for different areas. Uh, and the opportunity uh, that often arises in those contexts is to produce a lot of anxiety. And it's often coming at a very, very early stage. So I think one of the things that can happen, that can help is to take, take a step back and to try to start to take pressure off standardized tests through a variety of ways. One way is this motion, movement away from high stakes standardized tests to more formative tests, uh, where you're able to get in a lower stakes way some indication of how you're doing, 
uh, it actually can take a lot of pressure off because if you're, you know, just someone who's starting to pick up through formative assessments an interest that's different from, say, that engineering test your dad wants to take. And I'm using engineering because my dad is a civil engineer and he really wanted me to be an engineer. And so I remember, you know, early on just demonstrating more interest in liberal arts and English than I was in the math class. And so those kinds of formative uh, experiences can take a little bit of the pressure off. But a lot of it really is cultural, and, and, and it's finding ways for us to start to take the pressure off by helping people find their interests, helping them get more clear in what they are, are truly passionate about, looking for alternative mechanisms aside from standardized tests, this whole notion of going away from the, you know, I'm just a number to a holistic assessment where there's a portfolio. So these are things that are happening in different, different ways you see in Scandinavia and parts of the US. South Korea, there's countries that are starting to move towards that, uh, but other parts of the world are still in that traditional mode. So I think this, this, this evolution towards formative assessments, towards uh, more of a portfolio approach is gonna be part of that. And just educating, particularly parents, um, but also you know, institutions that it's, look, it's not just about the test. It's, this is a human being and they're worth more than their number. I think that, that message needs to really get out there. Great questions all. Here's another. Thank you. So my name is Asma. I'm a Palestinian American. And so I'd like to ask you, what advice would regarding the most important things to consider would you give to someone who's looking to found or even just sustain in an educational training center or a vocational training center? And this is a very different question than every other. But That's a great question, right. Asma. So what, what advice would I give to someone who wants to found an educational training center? A couple of things. I think number one would be know your customer, know your audience. And I think that when you're a founder, uh, and I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of founders, I find that the, the, the clarity on what problem am I solving for what customer is the first step. And, um, it's easy sometimes to say, ah, I want to found an organization to help kids or to help workers. But it sometimes can be broad, right? And so the more you can narrow in on a particular individual group and a particular problem. So let me give you an example. Um, let's imagine that uh, your interest is in teaching math skills to fourth graders. And you want to focus on women because you believe that that could be an enablement to uh, give women more opportunities, girls more opportunities to go into STEM fields. I'm giving an example. That's a very specific, because then you can start to really understand where are the levels of math for four, fourth grade girls, what type of um, foundation do they have, what other skills do they have, can teaching be done differently? And then it starts to open up different kinds of solutions because you're really focusing in on a problem. So I think at the very, very beginning of founding, I tend to really encourage a narrowing in of the scope to the very small uh, segment as you can of an audience and a very particular problem that you want to solve. You can go expand the institution and solve other things later, but in the founding stages, you're trying to still build a, build a proof of concept. And uh, in Silicon Valley, they often use the term product market fit, right, for startups. So the product is a training organization, but what's the market? And um, figuring out that, that fit with a small sample size earlier, I think, uh, gives you more opportunities to experiment. Um, the other thing I wanted to offer, and this is something that was hard for me to learn, um, but failing fast and having the courage to be OK with it is something that I think is another very important lesson. And I, I've, I've now, I think, after having launched things and seen them not quite work out and to go, OK, that's OK. Let me go learn and go move on and not taking things personally. So part of the reason I like to start small is because, you know, hey, I'm experimenting, I'm learning, and I just treat it as, as, as learning. As Marriott said, I'm just learning something new. So starting small with the customer set, picking one problem to solve, and being OK if your initial experiment doesn't work out. Uh, many of the greatest founders of nonprofits and companies in the world had many so-called failures, but that led to learnings that then created something amazing. Uh, so those are just a couple of initial thoughts. Asma, that's a wonderful um, question and a 
Brilliant answer, and we can't wait to see what you will do. Obviously, you're highly motivated. <laughs> I also want to say that I think this particular advice, two bits of it that you just gave, all of you here will be able to try out while you're in university. And that's what's so beautiful, because while in university, although the stakes are not low, you want to progress, they are not existential. You really have an opportunity to try things. And uh, you have an opportunity to fail a little bit. And the two things you said that I thought are really relevant, especially to capstones. For many of you, the capstones are still far away. But quickly figuring, first figuring out what is the problem you're trying to identify and to solve for and keeping that kind of confined. Not, you may start here, but get to that that essence, that quiddity of what you can actually do, that thing you can do. And even then, as you're getting ready to get ready, maybe you'll find out and your professor will say, you know what, this may not work. Feel fast, and I would say feel resiliently. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's so impressive, Ahmed, about you, because of course we didn't know about some of the things that didn't pan out before he became the president of ETS, but we knew about some and you were honest about them. And it didn't get in the way of Ahmed having this amazing job and incredibly important role in the world of education because you are resilient, you learned from it, you moved on. And again, these are things that, uh, that you get to try out. And frankly, they can, you will continue to try them out for the rest of your life if you are open to trying things. Yeah. So I, I really like the, the I, breadth I think, of that advice. I think that's right. And if I could be open and sharing, I'm going to just share with you some things that I did that didn't quite pan out, but I learned a ton from it. I, I alluded to it earlier, but mm -hmm. I'll just share. I, um, I thought I was going to go be a professor mm -hmm. and go get a PhD. I took the GRE. Thank you very much to ETS. <laughs> and I took it three times. Thank you very much to the retesting fee to ETS. And I ended up uh, getting into a PhD program, got a scholarship. I was excited. I'm like, OK, I'm on my journey. I'm going to be an academic. I'm going to do research. And I got to the first semester, and I was like, this is not me. And there was something about being in that program, and, and it, it, it felt quite theoretical, and it felt um, mathematical. And I just really wanted to help people and really wanted to be engaged. And I, and I also um, have probably that sort of pace of somebody who's more of a person in the world and likes to run things and operate things. And so I, you know, just said, all right, this is not for me. And I uh, was, was really grateful to a mentor who said, look, if this is not for you, don't do two years of it and grind out a PhD. If this is not for you, this is not for you. And it was actually a hugely helpful thing that, that helped me early on. Another example was I, um, after having uh, the opportunity to um, lead an institution or two, I thought, hey, let me go start up a something. So I started up a little organization and uh, started doing a variety of ed tech things. And I became an entrepreneur. You know, I started running like an entrepreneur, knocking on doors, pitching, and offering products and services of our unique educational service offering. And did that for a couple of years. And I loved it. I loved many elements of it. I loved being out there. I loved being solo. I loved being an entrepreneur. Um, and, but I realized, gosh, I'm kind of built more to run things. And it was a big self-realization for me that I, I'm, I'm, I'm someone who's comfortable running an existing organization and helping it scale and, and, and be successful and have impact than starting. There are um, friends of mine that are incredible at zero to one, taking something that's zero, it's, it's something new, and turning it to something. That's a, that the entrepreneurial, you know, what we think of as an entrepreneur. But I kind of like to think of myself as sort of like now, maybe like one to five or one to 10, that there's something that's already there, like in this case, ETS, and taking it to the next level. And that still requires an entrepreneurial mindset. You've got to find new opportunities. I'm here in the Gulf right now exploring opportunities for ETS, right? That's looking for opportunities and finding products and services to serve the Gulf. But it's doing it from a different organizational context. So we're kind of all on a journey. We're kind of all fitting ourselves into the world around us. And so for me, uh, you know, in a way that was failing fast, it was saying, okay, 
I'm not a zero to one guy, I'm more of a one to five guy. Okay, let me go switch back into that type of role. And I've got many more along the way, products that didn't work out. I had some ideas for different products and services. Gosh, uh, from my university days, I had thought there was this uh, product in Chinese medicine I was all excited about and launched a new certificate program and somehow nobody wanted to buy my <laughs> Chinese medicine certificate. So, so I've had along the way lots of learnings of things that I was passionate about and excited about and the market just didn't want it quite then. So, um, but I think you're right. I think it's just having that humility. You know, Early on in life, I took it personally. I said, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. What was I thinking? But I think I've now come to a, a realization that that resilience that Mary had mentioned, like learning that early in life and being okay with it. Um, a friend of mine once told me going to the balcony, you know, taking a step back from a, from a painful moment uh, in your career or in a decision you make and just going, this is really that big of a deal, right? I'm going to the balcony, I'm moving back. And in most cases it isn't, right? That, that ability to go to the balcony is such a powerful 21st century skill that it allows you to really give yourself the flexibility, the humility, the patience, the grace to go then try something new. Um, and that's probably one of the most important skills uh, in the 21st century, right? So most, one of the most important skills is to be able to bounce back, to not take, it too, to not take yourself too seriously. Um, so no, great, great, great question and great comment. Final question from someone? Yes, here, please. Hi, my name is Hamda. Hi, Hamda. <laughs> um, firstly, I want to say thank you for such a lovely talk and all of the uh, pieces of wisdom that you have given us regarding uh, education and global education. Um, I suppose the biggest interest as someone who has just started in her career, um, I would like to learn more about the career uh, aptitude test that you mentioned. Um, I know it's a bit more general, but I want to learn about like what the basis is it like psychologically based? Is it skill based? Uh, so on and so forth. <laughs> no, it's a great question, and, and we're 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 in the process of retooling uh, around it. But I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a sense of where we're headed. So there there's different stages uh, in our lives when we're thinking about career, right? When you're in maybe middle school or high school, you're at a stage in which you don't really know what's out there. So it's a little bit more career exploration or really just interest exploration, right? You're 12 years old, 14 years old. And so at that stage in life, the products that we're planning on making available are really about discovery. And it's, it's tapping into what makes me curious as a middle schooler or a high schooler and, and just kind of exploring it that way. It's not, tri it's not quite for tracking. It's not saying, ah, okay, I've got this interest in coding STEM, right? because somebody who's got interest in coding could be a great philosophy person or a great psychologist too. There's so many ways in which technology can intersect. Um, but it's just starting to help you get a feeling of what your interests are. It's like a mirror back to yourself. So those products that are gonna be more for K-12 are gonna be in that, in that sphere. Um, there's, a, there's a product in the United States I like called Johnson O'Connor. It's, uh, it's actually a 100-year-old test that um, helps middle school and high school students using blocks and a variety of very um, interactive ways to start to demonstrate competencies. It's, it's something that is, is very um, a visual and very interactive. And it, it has a variety of different types of experiences to allow you to get a sense of your, of your interests, really. Um, the, the types of assessments that we're going to be having in higher education uh, are going to be much more about career exploration, right? And so it's going to be much more about identifying and helping visualize different job types and saying, okay, this is what a product manager does. This is what a um, health analyst does. This is what an investment banker does or a nonprofit leader does or an entrepreneur does. And so there's different kinds of skills. Because what's a job? A job is a bundle of skills. Right? And so the opportunity is to say, OK, this bundle of skills are the activities I would be doing for that job. And so that's what the higher education career navigator, as we're calling it, is going to be focused on. It's helping identify connections to different bundles of skills that tie into a job. And by the way, that's another thing I wanted to offer, which is as you're imagining the future, right? you're imagining your first job or your second job or your third job, 
one way to think about it is what are the things I like to apply my skills to, right? Because a job is applying a skill. And so if, if there's certain activities that you enjoy, those can be detections of what you might be interested in. Um, and so thinking about a job is just a bundle of skills and my interest to those skills and doing those activities is a way to start to help you navigate through because this job may have a certain title, but when you dig into the job description, that's often where the, where the excitement comes in. Oh, that sounds like something I love doing. And so my son, uh, who uh, just became a freshman last week at NYU, uh, it, you know, he's got interest in theater, he's got interest in film, he's got a little bit of interest in marketing. Um, he did a summer uh, job this year selling uh, knives, uh, Cutco knives to bet that. <laughs> and so he's kind of, you know, exploring different kinds of, of interests. And so this notion of a job as a bunch of skills and, and, and working through that. So we're in the process of developing these different products and services. And it's this whole vision that we have at ETS to go beyond uh, higher education related standardized tests, but to really be, as Marriott said, more about lifelong learning enablement. Uh, we want to have our, our assessments really helping people fit into the work world much more, whether they're in K-12 or higher ed or they're already in work. Well, Ahmed, thank you so much. I think you've already answered more than once the question I was going to end with. So I'm not going to ask it again because you have given so much good insight to these students who will before long, inshallah, be graduates of this institution. Thinking of that first, second, third job as just bundles of skills that can connect to something in you that you can develop. I think that's a beautiful way to think about what an education can help you do and where assessment actually is needed. So I hope that you have, as I've come to know Ahmed uh, over time, that you can see, did it kind of amaze you that someone of such humanity and insight is the guy behind the tests? Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Think about that. Life is full of surprises. Everybody, thank you so much for being here. And thank please, let's much. give Ahmed our warmest and we Abu Dhabi. Thanks. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Thank you.